Hey, everybody. Welcome to Event Speak with me, Big John, CEO of Beyond Experiential, the interview show that lives on the Event Speak network, where we talk with industry pros across every part of the ecosystem of the world that we all know and love called events. Today's guest is someone that I think will probably be one of the most interesting and diversified guests that we have. Ari has his hands on a little bit of everything, but most notably co-founder of On The Go Marketing, which is a special place in my heart as they were the very first clients for Beyond Experiential. Uh, Samantha over there uh, is a dear friend and uh, are officially our first client. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome him to the forum. He is not only co-founder of On The Go Marketing, uh, belt designer, interior designer, uh, probably the coolest website I've ever seen. Uh, welcome Ari Foreman to Event Speak. Ari, how you doing, man? I am fantastic. I am right here in uh, lower Manhattan, New York City. And uh, despite all that's going on here and the chaos and, and, and for lack of a better term, the sort of Holocaust that we're under here, uh, I feel great and positive about the future both events, art, and uh, just Manhattan and New York City's thriving and surviving. That would be my first question to you, Ari. I mean, as, uh, I know you're a New Yorker um, and, you know, everything going on. I'm a transplant. COVID. Uh, you're, uh, you're a transplant, but definitely uh, a current New here. Yorker, right? But you're from, you're from L.A., time. right? You're from L.A., right? Originally. I was, yeah, I, I was born in Oakland, oddly enough, but I really don't know much about it. I've only been back a few times. And as a baby, my uh, parents moved down from being hippies in Oakland uh, to live in the streets of uh, L.A. in Hollywood. Um, and my whole family is from Philly. My siblings, my parents, everybody. I was the only one that was, you know, packed up in the VW van and born on the West Coast and uh, raised in L.A. And uh, L.A. LA was an incredible experience for me through the 70s. And as a child, I spent uh, a couple of years homeless in L.A. And at the end of that sort of journey, being homeless with my mother for years, uh, my father had moved back to Philly. They had separated years prior. And then I moved to Philly and I found myself to be this sort of native, non-born native Philadelphian because my family are from Philly. And I spent uh, 13 years there, which were really formative years for me in terms of, uh, of sort of honing my creative process and coming to age and sort of understanding the basics of marketing uh, and design and branding. And then uh, just when I was turning 25, I moved to New York City, and I've been here for 25 years. So it's really quite evenly divided in some ways, 12 years in, on the West Coast or in L.A., 13 in Philly, and 25 in New York. And they all have played a huge part in the way that I see uh, event, uh, experiential, and, and branding and marketing. They all have different collective con – they have a collective conscious, and they have different cultures. So, And it, I would say coming from um... – that that kind of a background um mm -hmm. reading a little bit about uh your history uh mm -hmm. i'm i'm interested because you spoke very candidly about you know running around the streets of hollywood uh before your um uh, moved to philadelphia at a young age and of course mm -hmm. a lot of turbulence i can only imagine uh with that but you said your mom provided a lot of personal and creative freedom um talk to me about how that freedom uh turned you into a designer turned you into an entrepreneur starting an uh, uh a marketing agency uh mm -hmm. expand on that a little bit um well my mother it, 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 like all parents we all i think every child has love and hate sort of relationships with their parents you know things that they feel they did well and didn't my mother was really trying to be this sort of progressive hippie type of a woman and uh both my parents were and it really to be honest with you it was quite experimental and it didn't really work out but in there was absolute freedom to be creative I mean, she didn't, she didn't prioritize any aspect of my education or any aspect of life above another. And creativity was sort of our only connecting point. And it was really this sort of DIY arts and craftsy type of a thing. And how that plays in is up until the age of 12, I was so able to think freely. There was really no wrong answers. Um, there was anything that I could imagine. My mom was like, well, yeah, why, why not kiddo? Why not sweetie? You know, like it was, I just didn't, I didn't think in terms of what was right or wrong. I just thought in terms of like, could this work? Is this an idea? Um, and that was, you know, in a very basic sense. 
but that just carried over with me by the time that I had some kind of discipline, you know, after being homeless in LA, after really being as free as you can be and as dysfunctional as you could be. As I came into this sort of functioning, uh, being part of normal life, let's say, and just trying to get into junior high and function well, because I hadn't gone to school for years, uh, going to high school, that creative thing hadn't, it never was stripped away from me. The educational system couldn't strip it away. And I, I, I thought very differently in everything that I did, even in high school, uh, in geometry, I actually found a way to find the circumference of a circle that was different from the way that I was being taught. It was clumsy and it was <laughs> took three times as long, but it was just that creative process of me trying to do that. And as, uh, part of it is kind of naive, but that really set the stage for me to be here talking to you, to have this sort of um, subversive approach to creativity within structured uh, industries and um, environments, you know, business environments. I could only imagine, Ari, because what you're saying to me essentially is um, it wouldn't have occurred to you that something isn't possible uh, based off of the kind of, um, you know, upbringing you had with, uh, yeah. with your mom. And I think something like that is invaluable um, in specifically in, of course, event marketing, but in any capacity of the creative process. Uh, and you're clearly a very creative guy. Now, um, I'm sure a lot of folks out there that are watching, they all know on the go marketing. If you don't, you should uh, really. Um, I'd be surprised I, I, if they did. <laughs> you know, well, I, will I was going to say this. I don't know if you know this, but, um, uh, you know, Samantha, uh, Samantha Adams uh, at on the go uh, has been a very, very dear friend and, 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 a, and a, my very first client, the first, first person to ever hire beyond experiential to do anything uh, was Yay. Sam. And, uh, you know, and she's been a wonderful friend and a, and a very uh, loyal client ever since. Um, and, you know, it was actually her that reminded me, she's like, you know, you're doing this, uh, you're doing this interview show, Big John on Events, but you should invite Ari. And then I got a hold of your website, which by the way, did you do your website or who did your website? Your website's amazing. Like, I it's designed real, it. It's, know, I'm no programmer, but I worked sure. as a programmer. And I was asking them to do things that didn't make sense. And, and, they, and, that, and that was the, what we came about, uh, <laughs> on the go Ari. So anyone out there that's like, what does this website look like? Uh, on the go Ari, A-R-I.com uh, to check it out and find out more about our friend Ari Foreman. But Ari, uh, answer me this now as I'm, I'm just, I had to take notes because there's just so much uh, stuff that you do and you're involved in. Um, We'll, we'll, we're going to circle back to on the go. Um, let's okay. talk about New York City a little bit now, um, is because I'm kind of yeah. curious to know what you know. There's that. There's BC before Corona. Uh, mm -hmm. There's current Corona life, and then of course mm -hmm. life um, post Corona. How is New York healing, uh, and how are things there now? How would you say the temperature of things in New York are, as um, you know, we seem to be at least the flattened curve with this wave of uh, COVID nineteen. That's that's a lot to say. You know, that could be a couple hours in of itself. Um, how is New York healing? I don't, I don't. New York isn't healing yet. Uh, it's sort of like an open wound. It's closing, but it's still open. You know, um, we're still. I mean, I, I don't want to be morbid, but there's still trucks full of bodies everywhere and they're still adding those bodies in. Um, the, the, the mass graves that are being dug for the people who have nobody that claims them. Um, people are starting to fill the streets again and it's a little too soon. Uh, we, I mean, it's, it's a very, it's a huge crisis here and it's for people who are carrying it or have it and beat it and don't even know it, they seem to have this thing like, well, this is nonsense. Uh, and at this, if, if people around the country sort of have this attitude in many places, and I think most people are pretty worried and conscious, but New York is really seeing, you know, the, the, the truth of this. We've all lost people. We all know people. I've lost three people, including my father two weeks ago. Oh, I'm so sorry um, to hear that, Ari. I didn't know that that was so recent for you. It's okay. He, um, it, as soon as, you know, people started talking about quarantine, I was like, this is going to hit the nursing home. My father has been sick for a while, Parkinson's and dementia. So I've been prepared for this moment for a while. I just didn't think COVID would be the one. And COVID, um, when 
looking at the nursing home that he was in, you see sort of a microcosm of what New York is going through, that people have to work and there is essential workers and there's people who have the luxury not to work and then there's people who are being let go from work. So all of this is happening just in one space and visit, people are trying to visit their loved ones. The employees are coming in from all five boroughs using the trains and buses. So they're carrying this thing in there. And, you know, a good majority of the nursing homes here in New York have been devastated and they've taken huge hits. Um, and my father, uh, you know, it, it wasn't surprising. I kind of assumed it was going to happen and I hoped that he would get through it. Um, but it really is an illustration of what New York is going through, that whether it's a family member or someone you know or a worker, a coworker, or somebody that works at the store, everybody's in contact with somebody who's, you know, is struggling through this in some physical and mental way, and it's touched everybody. And at this point, it's, it's almost like we all feel that we all must have had it or – and – how you know how do we come out of this how does the social aspect begin you know uh, how do people start going back into bars and clubs and restaurants is it just going to be people in the park for a while uh, are we going to stand six feet six feet apart are tables going to be six feet apart inside of a restaurant we just don't know what's going on here and so there's we're really not healing we're just sort of wandering you know it, it really it, it's sort of like a sustained 9-11 the day of 9-11 or the day after 9-11, the city was sort of lost. Most people stayed home. They just didn't know what to do. And the people that went out, whether they were curious or just habitually were going out, were just wandering. And everybody just looked at each other very solemnly, you know, like, it's just a nod, you know. Sure. And with this, we're all covered. So all we see in the eyes, so the eyes are the only thing to express anything as, you know, we're, we're seeing each other from a distance. We're it's a mourning. It's not a healing at the moment. And, and because anybody can still die here. Um, and I'm not trying to be overly dramatic. It's just very real. Um, the chef around the corner is gone. He was younger than me. Um, and uh, my friend's uncle is gone. Another, uh, my, my, one of my best friends, uh, one of his childhood friends, the father's gone. It's just, we're all touched by it. And we don't, we're not healing yet. We're now figuring out how to cope and reopen. And it's still a question. We just don't know. Summer seems like it's a wrap in New York. Are people going to be out and active? They're already out and active. It's pretty reckless. Central Park has been packed. Um, I think the people who are going to survive just feel like I'm going to survive and to hell with it. I'm going to live my life. And it seems a little reckless for other people, but I, I just don't, you know, to answer your question, uh, I know it was very long winded. It's um, we, we're just all sort of waiting. It's like, uh, the crash of, you know, the financial crash of 2009, 2008, 2009, mixed with 9-11, mixed with the blackout, mixed with Sandy. You know, we had those five days where we were in the blackout down here in lower Manhattan. Um, it's really all these sort of things rolled up in one and then stretched with, with loss. I mean, we lost two, however, you know, 2,100, 2,200 people on 9-11. We've already lost over 20,000. Yeah. So we're, we're, you know, and on top of it, to really make to make it worse, um, is that those of us who are trying to heal, you know, have lost loved ones. Um, we can, there's no we can't get funerals going. We can't uh, crematoriums are a month behind. We're storing loved ones are being stored in freezers indefinitely, in, in refrigerators indefinitely. I'm fortunate enough to have uh, friends in Brooklyn who their family businesses funeral parlors. They're, out, they're also a creative family, but people don't know that they actually own funeral parlors and they're all morticians. And so I was able to at least get a little bit of preferential treatment and have my father's body picked up and, and taken somewhere where I feel like he's at least, for lack of a better term, resting in a, in a place with loved ones. But it, I'm, I can't, my father can't even be cremated for another three weeks. And it's already been almost, it's been about three weeks now, almost. So it's a, it's going to take months for New York to heal. I think the rest of the country will fare better comparatively. Um, but New York, you know, this, this is what we do. It's the price you pay to, to have the access and the beauty of New York is to know that you're going to go through incredible highs and incredible lows. It's just part of New York life. I, um, <laughs> it, it's definitely an answer. 
All right. Um, my first and foremost, you know, really, uh, as someone that not, not because of COVID, but uh, both of my parents passed on in my life uh, before mm -hmm. I was 25. And uh, my sincere oh, my condolences God. from uh, from myself and all of our friends and family at Event Speak. What was your dad's name? All right. Uh, my father's name is Lanny. It's, Lanny. It's not a nickname. Lanny. L A N N Y. Lanny. Well, one in a million right. kind of name. Lanny Foreman, everyone. Um, it's it's something that, and this is important. People need to hear this. It's you know yes the 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 the, the show lives on the Event Speak Network, and yes we talk about events yeah. and and all those things are are very you know pertinent to uh, to our collective industry. But I I, I want to give people an idea that maybe aren't in New York City, that aren't in, we've been talking with people all over the world um, and mm -hmm. hearing, you know, their stories of what, what is, what is COVID life? How, what are the effects in Barcelona, Spain to, uh, we spoke with a friend uh, that's a professional musician out of Moscow, Russia um, uh, mm -hmm. last week um, that'll be coming up on an episode, um, you know, with New York City, which is, uh, I have a, a deep, a deep love and a deep passion for New York and New York has been very, very good to me and, and, and has helped my career uh, grow um, exponentially because of, uh, because of what New York has to offer. You know, there's a great saying about New York that I don't know who said it, uh, said that when New York sneezes, the world catches a cold. And um, I feel like what's happening right now in New York City is something that people need to know that because it's of our nature, I think, as a, as a people, as a country that, you know, we're about two months into the lockdown. Now there's a lot of areas that haven't been hit nearly as hard. Um, and then you, 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 it's, you, people start getting antsy. People are start, okay, this isn't so bad. And oh, the numbers are off or, you know, this city's doing that or this city's doing that. And we should be able to go about our lives and it's unconstitutional, all these things. And, you know, and I, I say to myself, listen, this is something where, especially for folks like us, where you're in New York City, I'm in Los Angeles, like the major cities where there's millions and millions of people, this is something people have to take very seriously. And if we are seeing a decrease in, in the numbers and we are flattening the curve, that has to continue so that when the inevitable second wave of this comes, it isn't going to be as deadly as I think it's going to be. I mean, historically speaking, if you look at the Spanish flu of 1918, that first wave mm -hmm. killed like five or six million people. The second wave killed like 50. And yeah. I feel like that is something that people really need to take seriously, that people yeah. need to, to not only worry of themselves and their loved ones, but what they're doing to consider the fact, for example, you're someone that had it hit you very very directly um, as yeah. your, your, your poor father um, felt subject to this because of pre-existing conditions, being elderly and being yeah. uh, someone that didn't have a chance, no matter which way you cut it into to young, healthy people, you know, that you're right. There are, yeah. there are a lot of cases, people that are, you know, they're asymptomatic or they're not showing any symptoms, uh, therefore going about their lives. And yeah. that's, uh, that's, you have to think about, the other people that you're potentially affecting. So take care of yourselves out there, people. Wash your hands, wear the mask, wear your gloves, follow the social distancing. Please take this seriously because this is not something that is just some sort of inflated hoax or whatever anyone else is saying about it or ever said about yeah. it. Um, but all right, let's, let's talk about this because as we're talking about on the go, and we're, mm -hmm. you know, you know, on the go, um, marketing, it started out as a magazine, correct? A subculture magazine in Philadelphia. Um, and, yeah. and correct me if I'm wrong, as you say in your bio, like you basically owned half of something that never made any money. Um, but yeah. you know, obviously leveraged <laughs> you into other things. Yeah. So I'm kind of curious, um, what kept you going during that time when you're trying to get on the go off the ground, you know, what did you do to make ends meet? Uh, the magazine specifically, correct? Yes. Uh, um, oh, well, we didn't. We're just young and dumb. So uh, that's kind of what you do. Uh, I, As a creative, I was really, really just happy to have an outlet that gave me validity. Even if it was just to an audience of five people, you know, I, I, it was nice to have an audience. And so that was the driving factor. And... Um, you know, being city kids and, and, and street kids the way we were, um, we did a lot of things to make it work and to stay alive. 
um, that, you know, I, I think a lot of people just wouldn't do, you know, we, we are, let's say that we had thicker skin. So, um, we would work our job. We had, we both, uh, me and Steve, both Steve powers. Um, he was working in a copy shop, which is perfect if you're trying to do a magazine because it's, you know, it's kind of conducive to it. It's print in its own way. And I was working in a stat shop. Most people don't know what that is, but that's essentially a, f a photography copy shop where you're making things for mechanicals for newspapers and magazines and stuff. Right. So we worked those jobs to pay our bills and then we didn't have any money for the magazine, very little money to eat. So we did a lot of creative things. <laughs> Shall we say, to, to make it work. Um, and, you know, nothing crazy, too crazy, but, you know, I get just it. Being city and savvy. And, and that was just it. And it pushed us and it pushed us. Then eventually we kind of, it, it didn't really crack through. We were getting a lot of attention. But when we moved the magazine to New York um, and we moved to New York because the music industry was here and that's sort of like it was, for the most part, art and culture, we'll just say. Um, we were getting... Uh, love from the uh, music industry in New York. The music industry in New York was always sort of like the biggest and then LA was sort of secondary. Um, so it just made sense. We were two hours away in Philly driving. Um, so we moved up here and our creative energy was sort of different. It was different from what people were doing here in New York. And that gave us a little bit of an edge. There wasn't much money to be made, but we started to gain attention. New York is just that way. If you're here in New York, and you're making, some, you're making unique noise, people will hear it. And those people are talking to the world. So it's a very different thing than when you're stuck in your, your beautiful creative city that you, that's near and dear. It may not have a global voice. It just has a local voice. And you come to New York and you make a little bit of noise, the global voice sort of reverberates. You know, it, just, it, it sort of sure. spreads across the Atlantic and goes everywhere. And from there, we were able to eventually get it up to our peak uh, to 42,000 circulated nationwide, very niche publication. Uh, we never made any money, but it paid for itself eventually. And what it did is where it was never successful monetarily, it gave us a cult following that allowed us a platform to do other things, you know, very subversive and creative and fun things. And uh, how that segued into on the go marketing makes no sense whatsoever. <laughs> that was my next question to ask you, man, because I, I have to ask you. With, with that being said, and that you know, mm -hmm. on the go marketing, um, you decide you're going to uh, start up uh, essentially an experienced marketing agency. Um, mm -hmm. What? How does that equation play out? Let, let's let's continue what you were just saying, specific to how that gave birth to on the go. Well, uh, with the magazine. I was really fortunate because Steve Powers, Steve Espo Powers, if you don't know him, look him up. Steve Espo Powers uh, is now a worldwide famous uh, fine artist. Um, some people would call him a street artist, but he's not a street artist. I mean, I think that belittles his, his work. Um, but his sort of approach to things really matured me and made me think very differently about my creative process. Um, he, he brought a certain intelligence to the creative process. So, when I started doing freelance, when, when he decided that he was going to pursue his art career, we were going to end the magazine, essentially, stop publishing because it was just crazy. Some things had happened that really prevented us from doing more. Um, he, uh, I started freelancing for my now partner in on-the-go marketing, on-the-go experiential. And we were, um, as I was freelancing with him, he really, he's a Long Island, a uh, very straightforward kind of conservative guy. Um, but with this sort of creative edge, we're very, two very different people. And I was just freelancing for him and he wanted to work with the magazine, he wanted to resurrect the magazine. And it just, you know, it was dead. It was over. Um, and so he, as he looked around and looked at sort of the things about it, he was like, well, what do you know about this guerrilla marketing? And that's what they were calling it. Then experiential is a fairly newer term. There was viral marketing and guerrilla marketing. And uh, there's a few other terms. Everybody's trying to coin a phrase, I think point of term um as the big acronym agencies do and we i was like well i know it very well because the it, to on one side of it because the magazine um and when we were promoting the magazine we had no money so what we did understand is from sort of like party promotion uh graffiti um sort of uh you know the punk rock days of of uh, that, that steve powers understood well of flyers being a cultural um, a, 
a call to action. So if they're placed in certain places and certain cultural centers, that they could be a, a huge call to action that you, you wouldn't realize that 10 cents could, look, could turn out to be a couple thousand dollars if it was the right thing. And as I started to talk with my now partner and he was interested in, he started mentioning guerrilla marketing, I said, well, I understand it from this standpoint. And with the magazine, we had to make five and 10 and $20 look like, you know, one thousand, two thousand and five thousand dollars We really understood how the experience and, and viral marketing could really have an impact at a very, very low cost because we did it. You know, it, was, it wasn't some genius sort of a thing as it was just us taking what we knew culturally and expanding on it. So as I was talking about this to my partner, I said, well, I know it from there. I think to, to translate this into corporate America wouldn't be hard because it, it would be more structured and certainly, to be quite honest, less creative in many ways. Um, why don't we give it a try? And so we, we just talked about it for about six months. And then finally he said, you know, let's do it. I said, okay. So then we, we sat down and we sort of not knowing he was from an advertising background and he was more of like the financial end of an advertising background. And I'm this sort of loose, creative publishing, you know, artist designer guy with a degree in graphic design does fashion. And, um, we really didn't know what we were doing. And, uh, and I think that was sort of our charm. It was, our ignorance was our charm because I put, we put together case studies that were based on the things that I had done for the magazine, sponsorships and parties and things like that. And then I connected, you know, skateboarding and fashion and other things into the, into the presentation, into the deck. And we hired a saleswoman, like just cold, you know, well, you looks like you'll be all right. You've never done this before. Neither have we. And she literally, this is 1999, so she opened up the white pages, the yellow pages and the white pages, and started looking for companies because, you know, the internet was there, but it wasn't as robust, and everybody's information wasn't there. And she did a cold call to ESPN and just started working around people, and it was, it was like a perfect storm. She called them up. We eventually got connected to one of the highest ups in, in production and marketing, and he was just like, well, you guys are ballsy. Um, yeah, why don't you come in and talk to us? So he came in and I gave him this presentation that was based on no actual corporate experience, but having on the creative end, because of my partner's uh, advertising agency, having some legitimacy there and me being this free creative, he said, well, you know what? We have $30,000 left over in a marketing budget, in a production budget, excuse me. Why don't you show us, and what it turned out to be was for ESPN X Games. And he's like, you have a skateboarding background, you have this art and subversive kind of background, and you know, you know music and hip hop, and why don't you, um, here's $30,000, I'm going to take a gamble on you. Just like that. Wow, we, that's I mean, awesome, $30,000 was crazy. And so <laughs> we, they had the worst creative you could imagine. And I said, can we redesign this creative? They said, yes. They let us redesign the creative. You know what the corporate process is. Anybody that's oh, watching this. Really? No kidding. It was, it was a free-for-all and because it was an experiment for them. They wanted to see if this form of marketing could help drive tune-in for television. And so we did a fantastic job. It was just local. It was, we did New York, New Jersey, Philadelphia because we knew it well. Um, for $30,000, we gave them a lot of bang. We did like the wrapped van and handed out stuff. We, you know, it was a lot of cliche things now that were sort of fun and uh, progressive at the time. And um, it, it worked out well for them. I don't know that they saw a spike, but they liked the energy and they liked the wrap up of it. And so soon after they were like, look, we're already planning next year. Um, but what we need you to do now is um, this is an ESPN property. Uh, yes, but we're working with Wyden and Kennedy. So we're going to turn you over to Wyden and Kennedy. And for those of you who don't know Wyden and Kennedy, that's Nike. Nike and Wyden and Kennedy are synonymous. It's like McDonald's and Coca-Cola. It just, they'll never not be together. And they turned us over to Wyden and Kennedy, who it's a creative place, but it's pretty formal. And they, we just started working with them and they loved my ideas. I could just go as crazy as I wanted to and they would reel it in. And we were doing year two with them nationally to drive, to do experiential, to drive tune in with a budget of, I forget what it was, but it was like a hundred thousand or 130,000. And this all happened so very fast. And because we were in Wyden and Kennedy, 
they started having us look at other ESPN properties. Then they brought us into Nike and I started doing Nike stuff. So it was really, you know, it was, you know, my ignorance was, was what benefited me because I wasn't playing it straight. I wasn't playing the straight man. And I found people who were all very straight and very buttoned up, you know? Um, wow. And, and that's just how it happened. That's it such was, a great story, man. That's, it, it sounds to me just like a very serendipitous kind of scenario where, you know, there's a lot to be said for, you know, I think, uh, part of what I've always loved about um, experiential and what I loved about uh, event marketing is that there there's a capacity for it to just where you can think outside the box, where you can, where you can just sometimes people in the right agencies, the right brands just want to, they want to ch- take a shot and they want to make an impression. And, you know, experiential has, I think, thrived for so long because it really is outside the realm of traditional advertising, which is why it exists. Mm-hmm. And it sounds mm-hmm. to me like, um, there was a bit of timing involved there. There's a bit of um, tenacity with having somebody picking up the phone and just going for it. You know, I've always yeah. had a very bulldog attitude towards, you know what? Ask them. The worst they can say is no. Go to the top of the ladder and ask them. And if they say no, ask them again. And if they say no the second time, then you, you move on to the next one, you know. Yeah. And or ask I, them 20 times. <laughs> or ask them 20 times, 20 different <laughs> ways. You know, that there's that yeah. fine line of, of uh pestering and and um persistence but you know it's uh that's that's just a that's very inspiring to me as a as an agency owner to to hear that because that's sometimes you know it only takes that it's like uh real estate you get your first property once you get that one property it gives way to others and that's clearly what's happened with you guys because on the go has been doing well ever since um and now it's interesting because uh you got on the go clearly and um Mm -hmm. Now you're also, you design belts, right? You've got your own custom line of belts that you make. Tell us about, I mean, clearly we know where that creativity comes from, but talk to us a little bit about <laughs> uh, your belts, Ari. Um, the belts, I, I, they're really, it sounds like, I mean, the way you're presenting it, it sounds like I've got this line of belts and they're shipping nationally. I just, I, I there's, there's, there's a demand for some of the creative things that I do and belts was just sort of this thing. Like I'm not finding the belts. I like, I'm just going to make them. And I'm, I'm sort of flashy. Like who, I don't need to wear a tie right now. I'm experiential. You never need to wear a tie. I just, I love it's beautiful stripes. It's a nice art nouveau style pattern. Fantastic you know. tie. Well, thank you, sir. Uh, I have the redundancy of having buttons and a collar bar, which is just ludicrous. You never, you do one or the other. You don't do both. Um, but that's sort of my approach to that. And the belts were that sort of thing is that I wasn't getting belts that were flashy enough or interesting enough. And it was just another place to apply my, my boredom, uh, on my off hours. So I started doing it and people started asking me for them. And before I knew it, um, the thing kind of went viral really quick and I had to reel it in. I was like, you know, suddenly I was getting offers to distribute all through Asia and do all these things or Japan specifically, Japan, they're very progressive that way. Um, and I, I, I pulled it back as a like, look, that's not, I'm not trying to be in that business, but I like knowing that I'm making custom pieces for certain types of people, uh, that, that are, um, um, inspired by things that they like colors, they like things that they do textures, or they just want me to sort of art direct it. So it's, it's sort of like commission pieces. Sometimes I'll make a bunch of them and sell them. And sometimes I don't, uh, the past year or so I've made almost none. Um, but, uh, you know, there's other areas of fashion and, you know, for those that don't know, uh, about some of my other exploits, I don't know whether they're going to touch on them, but, um, if you just Google me. Tell us about them. Um, give us the Wikipedia of, uh, your other exploits, as you say. Um, well, you know, I think a lot of it is, it depends on your level of interest in things. A lot of it is probably kind of boring, but. The one thing that is, is sort of defined me in the public side, um, because with on the go experiential, with on the go marketing, we're a white label agency, so we're invisible. Um, and that's simply because I, I just don't have any ego involved in the experiential world. I'm not interested in accolades from peers in that world. I'm not really, I don't, I don't really care too much for that. For me, it's the creative process, right? So um, people don't know me for that. And, and on the go magazine is so far gone. We stopped publishing in 97. There's not really much out there on the internet about it. 
There's another magazine that started with the same name. So the one thing when you Google me that comes up is this peculiar project where I decided to take my frustrations with on the go marketing in dealing with corporate America. Um, sort of the, the, the really kind of crazy subversive and progressive ideas I had that I thought could really be applied to experiential marketing based on, on a lot of sort of data and analytics of other progressive types, but not on industry standards. Um, and then me and my DIY sort of mentality and wanting to do, um, things that were involving my passion and, uh, uh, and are just going to, I mean, just, they're just going to make a statement that are really going to create some controversy to make a point. So in my frustration with some of my clients, um, I, I decided, and, and people not listening to me, not those clients specifically, but in general, the experiential world is run quite stiffly. You know, it's people that come through a machine that train them to be a certain way and they follow those orders. Um, and experiential by its nature should be far more progressive and creative because it really comes from that tenacious entrepreneurial standpoint of like, get out there, get in the way and get involved and, you know, sell the product or get people connected to your product. And so I was trying to take all these things, you know, this sounds crazy and it's hard to follow. I understand. But, um, and I created a sneaker and the sneaker was based on something that is a staple in the sneaker world, a, a model, a silhouette that Nike uses. And then, um, and I had been working with Nike for years and it stopped at this point. I'd also helped Steve Powers design a shoe for Nike that was a huge success. Um, and on the flip side, I had done uh, New York State anti-tobacco, where I had some very progressive ideas there. But the, the anti-tobacco industry is sort of a racket. It's all paid for by the tobacco industry. Uh, it's all part of the master settlement agreement between the federal government and um, tobacco industry. So that money is given out to agencies like yours and ours and, and um, to promote anti-tobacco, which, um, and it, it's so regulated of itself, it's, it's kind of non-effective with the exception of probably the truth campaign and, and, and a couple others that have really had the platform. Uh, all those things. Then I worked with tobacco. Now I'm a very anti-tobacco person. I have a family that suffered from it, uh, cancer and all kinds of illnesses due to smoking. Um, so I was very torn to try to, to do things to support my business and keep us afloat in the tough times and then promoting something that I feel strongly set against. So it really set the stage for me to take a silhouette, a sneaker that is something from Nike, a client that I knew that if I made mad, I, I probably wouldn't work with again. They might not appreciate the progressiveness at their expense. Right. Um, and I took anti tobacco, which if you're from the inner city, there's a brand called Newport. Um, that most people know it's a brand that established itself in the fifties really dug in and did really heavy advertising and promotion experiential in the sixties. Um, and I took those two things because they share a similar, the swoosh and the Spinnaker logo, put those together, put all those ideas that if I created something sub, uh, subversive, something very controversial that I could get people who would not listen to an anti-tobacco message, they would not listen to corp a corporate responsibility message to pay attention because it was so interesting, that it was so controversial, and that it would, that it would be embraced by a crowd that would raise its level so high, potentially, you know, it's an experiment, it's a case study, that I could then use that as a case study to go into corporate America and say, look, Look what I did from nothing, something that is essentially a piece of trash, something that is essentially a bootleg, a knockoff, that I redesigned, gave it all this depth, put emotion into it, put ideas into it, put ex uh, uh, um, experience into it from experiential and from publishing and from design and fashion. All these things mashed together and hope that it's a perfect storm. And it was. It sold out instantly. People slept out for two days. It was only a little amount, 252 pairs, but it was sought after. And this was 14 years ago and come full circle. Now it's bigger than it's ever been. The message is resonating bigger than it's ever been. People come into my DM and my Instagram and profess their connections to loss due to tobacco. Talk to me about their love for sneakers. Talk to me about uh, putting depth into things that are generally shallow, like fashion or something that the depth of, Fashion as an art is one thing, but it can have meaning and it can have 
uh, it can it can speak to people in all different levels of life. And these are just kind of crazy ideas. Just telling you this and you hearing it, you go, this this guy's insane. Like, what, you know, what is he even talking about? But to wrap it up, um, it worked and it worked well and it took time to resonate. And now what I sold for $250 go for $10,000 a pair <laughs> on the aftermarket, a shoe that goes for 10, because of the meaning, because of the connection to the purpose, because of the connection to the experiential of it, because of the connection to the understanding of um, design and how it meshes with corporate America and you know, the, the delicate balance and the lack of consciousness there. And, it, you know, it's very controversial. It's not something that I can just walk into a meeting with craft and say, hey, you guys want to see something that's crazy that works? They're going to look at you like you're crazy. Like, what? They're, I they're kicking you out the door. I wouldn't think they would. You know, I actually, uh, when um, I was talking with Samantha from your agency recently, and she sent me a, a link to a YouTube video uh, all about specifically uh, the shoe that you're referring to. Uh, is that video on your website? for uh folks um, that might want to check not, it out it's not on my website but it's it's very easy google my name's ari sale foreman it's vice vice is if you know vice media vice um really you know if, whether you love or hate them they're out there to kind of create controversy right and they reached out to me and it was i told them yeah let's talk about it but let's go in depth let's not just make it about the sneaker or about the art let's talk about everything and how it touched my life how I put, you know, sort of the meaning of the things I went through with homelessness and with my mother and substance abuse in my family, all these things sort of went in to this very neat package. And, um, and they really, they delivered. So they you really did. go to YouTube, they delivered. It's short, sweet, it's 15 minutes. Um, and it's, it's power packed. So just Ari Foreman on YouTube. And of course, uh, on the go, Ari, A-R-I dot com. Ari, listen, I, I have to tell you, it has been nothing short of a pleasure talking with you today. Um, I'd love to have you Thank back you. anytime. Um, and sincerely, uh, you know, it's funny, uh, anyone that's watching that knows me knows well that I, I've worked for on the go for years, even long before yes, uh, I had, I was lucky enough to, to have you guys as clients. Um, and, uh, I've never had the chance thank to say you. thank you. So Ari, it's, uh, it's been such a pleasure talking with you today and thank you for everything that you've done. Uh, and I'm sending love to you and your family and, and with your loss of you, your sir. dad and my love to New York city. Um, Guys, this is Event Speak with me, Big John, CEO of Beyond Experiential at www.eventspeak.com. Please, by all means, Thank take you. care of yourselves and each other, and we'll see you next time here on Event Speak.